Hello and welcome to our quarterly market views discussion. Markets have made new highs in uh, the last financial year with the Nifty doing almost 28% but the broader index BSC 500 up almost 40%. And uh, more so by the, you know, helped by the small and the mid cap index, the small cap index is up almost 70% and the mid cap about uh, 60%. Uh, with that, uh, wishing everyone a very prosperous uh, financial year 2025 and hoping for markets making newer highs. With that, let's start with our discussion for this quarter. Hiren, we have a very important upcoming event, uh, which is the elections. And uh, you know, you've basically interacted with investors direct directly for the last three decades. And what we've kind of noticed is that although most investors are aware that long term wealth is not dependent on short term volatility, and the more they stay in for the markets in the longer term, uh, the, the more compounding uh, results they get or more returns they make. But most kind of way near term events like the elections before uh, deploying funds into the market. So here that we have the elections, what would you suggest would be the deployment strategy uh, for the coming year before the elections or when they are looking at different events? So Himani, uh, you know, this is not a new question. Uh, investors are always at crossroads when there is a major event that happens. Uh, and as Daniel Kahneman would say, we all believe that investors and humans are rational beings and then we take very rationally thought decisions especially when it comes to money but uh, Daniel Kahneman who passed away recently was a Nobel laureate uh, he won the Nobel Prize in 2002 for behavioral economics thinking fast and slow his and book he wrote is very this book famous. thinking fast and slow and his research showed that while Economic theory says that people take rational decisions, but people actually take a lot of emotional decisions. People take very quick decisions. They may not think through everything, right? So if I were to say that uh, there is a 98% probability that the current government will come back and hence markets will do okay. Let's say hypothetically go up 5%. And there is a 2% probability that for whatever reason, this government doesn't come back, which would be a shock to the markets and the markets would be down 20%. If I give this choice to people, uh, as per Daniel Kahneman's research, most people would focus on the minus 20%, right? Because it's a bigger number. It invokes fear that, oh, if the markets go down 20%, they will not think rationally that there's only a 2% probability attached to the outcome of minus 20%, right? So, being nervous ahead of any big event is quite natural how people think. However, having said that, if, you, if we look at the hard data of the last seven elections that India has seen, right from 96 up until 2019, except for the first two times, which is in 96 and 98, where the markets were very wobbly after elections, and that was largely to do with the fact that our politics was very fragmented. We did not have a stable government. Those, that was an era of coalitions. And also our macroeconomic conditions were much weaker. It was in the aftermath of the Asian financial crisis that a combination of political instability and weak macros caused negative returns in the markets around elections. However, if you look at the subsequent trends, it's very clear that what markets like is political stability and policy momentum. So where we are today, I think our macro is at its best and we have a very stable government. And as I said earlier, that there is a very high probability that this government comes back. And they've also articulated that as soon as they come back, they're going to take even bigger decisions, right? So to my view, uh, and we've held this view for a long time that we are very constructive on the markets. To me, it will be a very suboptimal decision to wait for until the elections to deploy. So I think my advice to investors would be that if you have to deploy, please go ahead short-term events 
don't matter and specifically in this case where we are today both in terms of the quality of leadership and the stability as well as the policy momentum my sense is that it would be uh, it would not be a great idea to hold back uh, investing just because this event is there got it that's true because in a democracy like ours uh, policy continuation and uh, political stability actually re results in better returns in the market then uncertainty market actually doesn't like uncertainty so whichever party but if there is stability and there is continuation of reforms it kind of helps the market much more in terms of global event uh, alok there is uh, this you know there's some buzz about japanese interest rates increasing after being negative for almost 8 years uh, and that kind of brings an end to you know easy money or you know a lot of uh, uh, quantitative easing that was happening globally do you think that will impact flows and therefore fii in flows into our country so i mean it's uh, true that uh, bank of japan has ended its uh, monetary easing policy which was one of the most aggressive ones seen in modern history and also the last country to end its uh, negative rate policy but it has also maintained an accommodative stance in terms of the monetary policy out there looking at the rates the earlier rate was minus 0.1% the new rate is the range of 0 to 0.1% it's a very marginal number but the stance remains accommodative having said that what how a carry trade works is uh, somebody would borrow in a low yielding yen and invest in higher yielding assets if everything else is constant the cost of borrowing has gone up and therefore it should marginally impact the profit margins and hence the carry trade but you look at the numbers even now in japan the real rates are negative the usd yen rates they have gone to a 34 year high that means yen has depreciated to a 34 year new low against the dollar that will encourage trade even more net net all things combined the carry trade will still go on as long as there is higher growth potential higher rate differentials continuing elsewhere in the world looking at the flows in india japan is a large contributor to the flows in india uh the largest co comes primarily from us side and the latest policy uh, statement the us was talking about cutting down in their bond selling program the positive from that more than outweighs for any kind of negative impact that may happen to the yen carry trade so let net as long as the macro and the corporate earnings growth program in india continues to be good uh, the flows are only going to get accelerated on the positive side that's very interesting alok uh just here continuing on the point on flows uh last year we saw almost 25 billion dollars of fpi flows into the country and uh, you know many fear that we may not see you know that that could change in the coming years and the whole uh, uh china plus one and you know we basically most people think that china plus one is what is benefiting indian flows and that could basically reverse uh and we may not see the kind of fi flows that we saw uh, over last year or in fi 24 uh, what is your view on this do we see do you think that we will continue to see fi flows uh, uh, into our markets so does it even matter himani now uh well jokes apart uh, uh, as you know that in the post covid era uh domestic flows have played a much more significant role in the markets in india than fi flows and again you know this is not to be little the importance of fi flows uh yes last year was a positive 25 billion number but we must not forget in the previous two years it was a large negative number right i think having said that the only pushback that fi's have uh about india I don't think they debate India's structural growth story. I think they all believe in the Indian structural growth story. Uh but I think where most concerns come from is when they look at the relative valuations, right? They believe India is trading at an expensive Indian markets are trading at an expensive valuation. Now, obviously you have to dig a little bit deeper, right? And if you look at the numbers again, if you look at the last 10 uh, you know, currently in MSCI India which is what the foreigners look at is trading at an 84% premium compared to 59 to 60% premium that it has traded in the last 10 years 
over the emerging market index, right? So India is at an 84% premium. The 10 year average has been 60%. And that's deterring a lot of uh, FIs from coming in. However, it will be interesting to note that in that same last 10 year period, in absolute terms, India's earnings went up by 60% in dollar terms, in absolute terms, over a 10 year period. And emerging markets had negative earnings growth, right? So first of all, whether historically or even if you look at going on a, on a going forward basis, India's earnings growth has been far superior to emerging markets. And we all know very simply that markets pay up for growth. So now I think they themselves have to answer the question whether they want to invest in relatively cheaper markets with either no earnings growth or relative less earnings growth or do they want to pay up for visibility and higher growth. So over the next two years, let's say calendar 24-25, MSCI India earnings growth is likely to be 21% and emerging markets going to be 15%. Again, India is likely to grow 40% higher than combined EM, right? And I think therefore the, the premium is justified. Having said that, I do believe that uh, once the elections are out of the way and there is visibility for the next five years and there is policy momentum, I see no reason why foreigners would not come and invest in India. And I just feel that as India keeps becoming more relevant on an incremental basis in terms of driving global growth and also as it becomes the fifth largest market cap country, I think it's difficult to ignore a market as big as India. Right? So, so I think I wouldn't stress too much about how much the, whether the FIs will come in or not. But I think that given India's superior earnings growth, and policy momentum, I see no reason why FIs won't come to India. Absolutely agree with you, Hiren, on this point. So we've already discussed major events and that that, are, that have happened or are going to happen like elections. We've discussed flows. And the next question that comes up usually in investor mind is also sector leadership. Uh, in the last uh, year, we have been very bullish on cyclicals and that's kind of worked for us. Do you think in the next financial year, sector leadership would change uh, and uh, how, are we, how, how are we positioned for it? So, Imani, sector leadership or the owner can be classified into various ways. So, some classify it on the basis of ownership, like saying we concentrate on private side, don't look at PSU side or don't look at foreign side. That can be classified on the basis of market cap. You started off by saying that last year the large caps are up 28%, the small and mid caps are up 50, 60, 70%. That prompted a lot of people to say that small and mid caps have rallied and hence they will not rally. I don't know whether there is any statistical measure to that. But what's important is market tries to reward earnings, visibility of earnings and the certainty of those earnings coming through. So that's what the history is all about. When we look at a larger picture, in India, we have good set of data for at least last 20-25 years. Typically, we have seen larger cycles, they are from one crisis to the other. So let me uh, divide into three parts. Say 2003 was the end of that dot-com bubble bursting. Until then, the next crisis happened in 2008 January, that was the financial crisis. That period was the 2003 to 2007 period, which was largely investment-led. Most infrastructure, energy, B2B businesses did very well during that period. Consumer facing businesses did very poorly. So the next cycle was from the global financial crisis till the COVID crisis. COVID happened early 2020. So from 2007 end till about 2019 end was the exact reverse. Anything that did not work in the previous cycle was the success mantra of this cycle. And the ones that were the biggest successful ones failed here. Cycles changed again. The most of the parameters, most numbers, post the COVID bounce back, show we are in a much, much similar cycle to the 2003 to 2007. 
So where again, infrastructure led B2B businesses, CapEx oriented stuff, governments resolved to have more and more CapEx being done, those things are tiling up. So as long as those things go on right from the top, as long as capacity utilizations remain high, earnings growth bounce back, it becomes critical. So now let's look at the numbers as well. Some part of the rally in cyclicals has happened in the last couple of years. Mm. Cyclicals is, is a group of sectors, so like utilities, industrials, materials, real estate, communications, they all fall under this one, primarily B2B businesses. Some of them could be government dominated, some of them could be private dominated. In 2003, the combined weightage of these sectors in India was close to 41%. Mm. That was the start of the up move in this sector. Mm. By the end of 2007, their weightage had gone up from 41% to 67%. This is not a joke because during this period, the broader market BSE 500 was up anywhere between three and a half to four times. That means this cohort was up nearly nine times. That was the kind of rally it had. Between that period, that was a big rally, but that rally happened, what happened two years prior to that? From 2001 to 3, there also this cohort of cyclicals was up four times compared to BSE 500 up of two and a half times. Hmm. Fast forward to now, in the last three years, cyclicals are up three times compared to the BSE 500, less than two times. But can they really bounce back? Currently, their weightage is only 38% in the markets, lower than the starting point that was there at the beginning of the previous rally. Mm. So a lot of people think and say that they have rallied significantly, mm. but possibly they are extrapolating or focusing far too much on the last uh, bit of uh, one year or two year rallies. From 67% weightage in 2007, from where I see, they are down to 38%. Mm. So if the earnings growth continue, mm. the pace at which they are, uh, we will not be surprised if they continue to do well. And that's what we think. Our research suggests that most of these sectors are in a very, very sweet spot, under-owned, far lesser competition now, a lot of consolidation has happened. But more than anything else, it is the visibility of growth from the top line and the order books that is driving our confidence. That's in very interesting, Alok. Uh, the other question then that comes to, uh, you know, most investor minds is also that, you know, if we see uh, th the last quarter numbers that were released, uh, we saw a flattish top line, but uh, earnings were driven more by margin improvement. As we uh, get into the quarter four and, you know, the next financial year, the, uh, the base on margins has already kind of gotten back to the levels it was earlier. And so we would not have any earnings coming from uh, margin improvement. So, so from year on for FI25 onwards, we will need a more thrust on top line improvement and either volume or uh, uh, realization base. Uh, the fear that most investors have is that the earnings growth from year on may not be as strong as it was earlier. Hiren, uh, what's your view on this? So, Himani, as you know, over the last several quarters, we've been tracking the earnings trend for the top 500 companies. And we did, we did mention that all the margins that we lost post the Russia-Ukraine war and the subsequent three quarters where we saw the compression in EBITDA margins, more or less we've made it back by the end of the third quarter. Now, maybe in the fourth quarter, we may still see a little bit of residual improvement in margins, but you are absolutely right that from here on, if earnings have to grow, then we also need top line to grow, which means that you need economic activity in India to grow in a very robust manner. If you look at some of the lead indicators, right, uh, and for the month of March, we had the GST numbers that came out, which was actually a record high. We are already seeing signs of private apex uh, being rolled out. And if you hear some of the uh, senior ministers and even the prime minister himself, they've been talking at various fora recently. Uh, 
where they are very clear that if they come back, they are likely to double down on infrastructure spending, focusing on make in India, uh, you know, semiconductors, railways, defense, uh, you know, these the very sectors that Alok spoke about, the so-called cyclical cohort of sectors, is where they will continue to grow. And in fact, uh, we do not know, we'll have to wait and see. They say that even bigger decisions are uh, uh, are in the offing, right? So I think that in a situation where last two quarters, India's GDP has been surprising on the upside. And not only domestic economists, but even foreign institutions like the World Bank, etc. have had to upgrade India's GDP forecast. And this is not something which is trivial because, you know, a GDP is a very well-tracked number. It's not just tracked in India, but it's even tracked globally. And this is, the reason why I'm mentioning this is that this is just a beginning to what may be a longer-term trend. That, to me, some of the lead indicators show that the Indian economy is likely to surprise on growth on the upside. And therefore, I have no doubt that even going forward, uh, earnings will grow in healthy double digits. Now, obviously, the consensus for the next two years, at least for the Nifty, is for earnings to grow somewhere in the region of 14 to 16 percent. So, Imani, if you look at the data for the top 200 companies, the NSC 200, right? Uh, if you disaggregate the sectors again, right, 60% of the sectors which largely constitute financials, IT services, and consumer staples uh, are likely to grow more in the 8 to 12% range. However, 40% of the sectors which were largely cyclical, as Alok mentioned, which includes real estate, capital goods, power, infrastructure, uh, you know, all these sectors are, the earnings growth is likely to be more in the range of 20 to 30 percent, right? And if I go back to Alok's, uh, 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 you know, sectoral leadership that he mentioned in the 2003 to 2007 cycle, at, in, in that cycle, the nifty earnings itself compounded at 25 percent mm. a year, mm. right? And I wouldn't be surprised that given that our GDP has been surprising on the upside, some of the leading indicators are telling that growth is fairly robust, that the, this consensus earnings estimate of somewhere between 14 to 16 percent, we may end up at a higher number. And this will happen for two reasons. One is that as the sectors which have a lower weight currently in the index continue to outperform, their relative weight will start going up. And therefore, the earnings growth of those companies will have a more pronounced impact on the average. Mm. right? And that's how typically uh, the surprise on the earnings also come in. So I think that while the best of the tailwinds in terms of margins would be behind us, uh, at least I think from the next two to three year perspective, I do believe that there will be a good robust top line growth as well and some operating leverage. Having said that, uh, given, our, you know, while we still very uh, bullish on the next couple of years earnings growth trajectory, we must be mindful of the fact that in the very near term, we've seen crude oil prices spike to $90. We've seen copper prices starting to move up. We continue to see geopolitical problems in the Middle East, the Red Sea problem. Uh, we had an earthquake in Taiwan. So we just have to be mindful that some of these things may impact margins in the short to near term. But having said that, I think structurally, uh, I do believe that just like our GDP growth, I think earnings for uh, corporate India will continue to surprise and led by 
the so-called cyclical sectors or the investment oriented sectors. So in my view, the leadership will continue. These cycles are not short. They don't last for one or two years. They typically last. These are multi-year cycles. And I think we are fairly well positioned in all our portfolios uh, where uh, we have a fair representation uh, of individual uh, stocks that we like in some of these sectors. Uh, and therefore, we hope that uh, you know, our portfolios are well positioned and will continue to do well as these sectors continue to perform over the next few years. So, if I can uh, put it in short or, you know, give a gist of what we were discussing on earnings and cyclicals, we remain bullish on cyclicals. Cyclical cycles actually stay for a longer time. We remain bullish on the earnings growth. There are sectors which form a very small part of the overall index currently where the earnings growth is very strong and these can give us uh, major, uh, uh, you know, uh, multi-baggers and uh, we remain kind of, you know, we look for these uh, stocks and we will remain invested in them. Um, from here on, we remain bullish on the macro, we remain bullish on earnings growth um, and uh, stay with us while we stay invested in you. Mm -hmm.